<laughs> I want to talk this morning a little bit about sports. It's the Super Bowl Sunday. About learning how to think, how to address life like a scientist. About becoming more, and about becoming more racist, more anti-racist as a congregation. And about resiliency or perseverance as Bob was talking with the young people about. And this title, Fail Again, Fail Better, as I'll, you'll get later, I, I learned it from my biology teacher who, uh, in high school, would say it repeatedly and drive us crazy. Um, but I read this morning, after I typed this whole thing up, I thought, oh, I'll go online and see. <laughs> so Samuel Beckett is credited with having said regularly to his uh, actors um, and the people he's working with in the world of drama, uh, um, try again, fail again, fail better. So. A few nights ago, I got together with three college friends for dinner at in San Francisco. Over the course of the evening, with the Super Bowl coming up, we each shared our thoughts and feelings about athletic endeavor and our personal experiences, both as athletes and fans. I was a pretty decent athlete in my school days, especially in track and cross country. On the track team, I ran the two mile, which when a track was 440 yards, was an eight lap race. Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We all agreed, the four diners, that the training and discipline we learned in sports had transferred well into our adult lives and responsibility. One legacy of those days for me is a tendency to employ track and field metaphors to my professional life. Our congregational year runs essentially from Labor Day through June, and I often find myself approaching it as an eight-lap race. It is critical when running the two-mile to get out fast. One's first lap needs to be one of the fastest quarter miles. I tend to think that of that lap as going from September 1st through the Pacific Central District ministers, Autumn Ministers Retreat, which is held uh, right around October 1st. I do my best to jump in in my work during September with both feet, helping launch new programs, attending many meetings, learning names, and doing all I can to get the church year off with a bang. The second lap, mid-October through Thanksgiving, has to be run quickly, too. Then come laps three through six and a half, which are kind of a steady slog. Here is where stick to perseverance, kicks in. Keep your focus, keep up the pace, don't slough off. Halfway through the penultimate lap is when I start my kick, right through General Assembly toward the finish line. Of course, congregational life is much more complicated than this. Much like a large invitational track meet with shot putters and javelinists throwing things, hurdlers jumping and assorted spectators and photographers walking around, the eight lap notion is just a highly simplified model, an idea I carry in my mind, providing a way to approach the September through June year. One autumn, a few years ago, toward the end of my second lap, I attended a three-day in-field service training module led by the author of our second reading, Paula Cole Jones. Paula Cole Jones led has led, rather, anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism workshops throughout the Unitarian Universalist denomination for close to two decades now. I had read of her work in a few different editions of the UU World, and I looked forward to attending her workshop. It was very challenging. 
At the end, Paula asked all those in attendance what they might promise to do to further anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multiculturalism within our various congregations and across the UUA. I pledged that henceforth I would encourage meaningful conversation about these issues in whatever church I was serving. Upon my arrival here last summer, it was clear to me that you had already been involved in this pretty seriously here at UUCIL. Today, I want to join in with you and carry the baton another few laps around the track. It's impossible to study American history without recognizing the important role race has played. From the near genocide of our indigenous inhabitants, the brutal importation of millions of Africans to support our, our slave economy, their continued enslavement for two and a half centuries, followed by over 150 years of Jim Crow sundown towns, and gentlemen's agreements that persisted into the last years of the 20th century. Unitarians have been in the forefront of recognizing and trying to recti rectify these crimes. However, we have done some things we ought to be ashamed of, most critically being all too willing to assume that only well-educated, Europeanized people would ever find the UU way of doing religion relevant, or that we could not benefit from integrating worship forms and spiritual practices that evolved elsewhere outside of Europe or New England. The Unitarian Universalist Association has been committed to being anti-racist, anti-oppression, and multicultural since the passage of a General Assembly resolution at the 19. 97 General Assembly, so 20 years. A few congregations in our movement are truly multicultural, wherein no one racial group comprises more than 90% of the congregation. Each one of these congregations is growing and attracting many younger members. As our movement has become more committed to nurturing multiculturalism, more and more congregations have struggled to grow beyond Eurocentrism. They've had mixed results. It's not easy for anyone or any community to transcend racism and classism that are intrinsic to American culture. There are many, many three steps forward, two steps back days. Nevertheless, it is important and a wonderful opportunity. This congregation, at a little over 4% non-Anglo, is, I think, among the more racially diverse congregations in the Pacific Central District. I believe that you can build on this. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, I mean, I'm a sixth generation Unitarian, and we're doing better now than we did for the last five generations behind me. Um, but it's... It's something to grow, to, to build on. Um, I believe that you can build on this if you want to. Now, I hope I would like to, and I hope the rest of you would too. First, however, back to sports. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are this morning, halfway through an eight lap race. The thing is, I do not want to sugarcoat this. When it comes to transforming UUCIL, into a truly anti-racist, anti-oppression, multicultural congregation, what we're looking at is more like an 18-lap race. To become victorious in such a sacred endeavor requires sticking to it over a long, long course. One of our struggles will be coming to terms with the ways in which we are all sullied by culturally pervasive racist and classist attitudes. I mean, there was a great deal of resistance last summer to those who were using the term about the ways in which our movement has operated um, as uh, white supremacists. Because that, we think of Ku Klux Klan and so on, what many people do. But, um, but there are ways in which we are because of the 
dominance of the culture, which is white supremacist, or definitely recognizes as normative the supremeness of white culture and white, um, white ways of doing things in the past. As a youth, I did not think I was racist at all. My parents were committed to integration and actually had parties with uh, interracial uh, attendance. Uh, I had Asian and black friends at junior high and high school. I wasn't, it was not until I was out of college that, and I took my first job, that I got in touch with the many ways I'd picked up, almost by osmosis, the racism and classism of our prevailing culture. Now that first job was as a teacher for the Central Brooklyn Model Cities, that's Bedford-Stuyvesant, New York, which is um, a pretty rough neighborhood, about as rough as I've ever known. And I was one of only six whites at a school of 670 students and staff. It was in Model Cities that I became aware of racism as a white problem, not a problem of the marginalized. As a member of the privileged white class, I could always move out of Central Brooklyn and ignore all the struggle there, but my students and fellow staff members could not. They always had to deal with the scene. People of color figure this out by the time they are four or five years old. Some Anglos never figure it out. One of the participants in Paula's workshop was Reverend Wanda Daniels from High Country. From the, she serves a church in Copper Mountain, Colorado, which is near uh, Breckenridge and Vail. But at that time, she was in Billings, Montana. Anyway, Wanda pointed out a second obstacle preventing us from embracing multiculturalism, what she called our theology of perfection. By this she meant the expectation among too many UUs that we should be perfect, that since racism is an imperfection, UUs couldn't be racist. It wouldn't be right, and we're not, of course. Thus, rather than address the ways in which we can be racially and ethnically insensitive, uh, many of us just ignore the issue. Now, if we want to grow numerically, if we want to be more attractive to young adults, if we want to get more involved in the vital issues simmering in the greater community, then it seems to me we cannot ignore these issues any longer. We have to, one, be willing to continue talking about this stuff with one another, especially listening to the non-Anglos among us. And two, we've got to let go of the theology of perfection. Another sports analogy might be helpful here from the world of baseball. Uh, baseball is one of my great passions. I try to hide it, but uh, <laughs> one of the things I most enjoy about the game is that the greatest hitters in the sport, those who hit over 300, fail seven-tenths of the time. Seven out of ten times they come to bat, they fail to get a hit. And these are the very best players in the game. I'm reminded of my 10th grade biology teacher, Mr. Joe Chadbourne. He was a good teacher, well-liked and fair. He had one habit, however, which drove us all nuts. Whenever someone asked him a question, instead of just answering, he would ask the questioner how he might design an experiment that would reveal what, the, what he wanted to know. <laughs> Venturing a suggestion, he'd set us to work actually doing the experiment <laughs> to see, after all, if our idea worked. When the experiment failed to produce the hoped-for results, Mr. Chadbourne would say, OK, how would you modify the experiment to make it work and set us back at it? Fail again, he'd say. Fail better. This could go on for a long time. <laughs> Can't you just tell me the answer, Mr. Chadbourne? <laughs> 
And it was very discouraging at first. There was wisdom, however, to Mr. Chadbourne's teaching method. He was trying to teach us how to think like scientists. And to think like a scientist, one has to be resilient. Thomas Edison is a great example. Edison acquired over a thousand patents in his professional career, but his most famous invention was the incandescent light bulb. Investors had been attempting to make, inventors rather, had been in, in attempting to make electric light bulbs for decades, but they had all chosen the wrong material for the filament, platinum, usually, mostly. Edison experimented with thousands of other materials until he finally hit upon tungsten, which lasted longer and glowed more brightly. A short time before his discovery, discussing his progress with anxious, indeed quite annoyed, investors, Edison explained, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that will not work. And then, just a few weeks later, breakthrough. Fail again, Mr. Chadbourne would say. Fail better. A theology of perfection tends to be uncomfortable with failure. But neither Ichiro Suzuki, Buster Posey, or Jose Altuve, great hitters in baseball, or Thomas Edison, a great scientist, were ever uncomfortable with failure or debilitated by it which has a lot to do with their ultimate success. Building UUCIL into the kind of place it could be, and that in my opinion you are very well poised to make it, will of course mean risking failure. It will mean risking success too, which my late uncle Hal, a uh, Freudian uh, hotshot, the San Francisco Psychoanalytic Society reminded me throughout my adulthood that um, risking success was a far deeper fear, psychologically speaking, than risking failure. In the words of the best-selling author, social activist, and peace activist, Marianne Williamson, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. This congregation is poised to become the anti-racist multicultural congregation in the Tri-Valley. Orthodox congregations with their emphasis on tradition, hierarchy, and scripture are weighted down in a way we are not when and if we choose to fly. No doubt you will fail many times, but one is only a failure if she or he declines the challenges facing them. And this particular challenge, I know you have the chutzpah, the skill, and the passion to accept and to meet. Other congregations have succeeded in this effort. Approximately 7.5% of American congregations are, in fact, multicultural. But none that I am aware of in the Tri-Valley. UUCIL can be that congregation in this community. Not all of our churches and fellowships are ready to step up to this endeavor. I cannot help but recall in this context an incident that occurred to me 30 years ago while serving our UU congregation on Martha's Vineyard Island. A folk orchestra was performing at the church one night when, gradually, beginning about halfway through the performance, members in the, of the audience, including four or five children, stood up and began to dance, when I say dance, they were just kind of swaying with this beautiful, mostly string instruments, um, and uh, just swaying gently to the music that was filling the church. Suddenly, the minister emeritus, the very picture of an aging, chalk-dusty, bedandrift intellectual, 
began waving his hands and hollering, sit down, everyone sit down, he demanded. The foundation of the building is too weak to withstand any movement. Sit down. I have no doubt that for the Reverend Kenneth Smith, dancing in church would somehow destroy the foundation upon which he understood Unitarian Universalism to stand. Maybe that was true throughout New England at the time. Maybe it is still true. But it is not true here. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we can dance, as worshipers in this area have for centuries, really. And we can sing with syncopation and celebrate kinesthetically all we want. Because here, out west, our foundation is less hidebound and far more physical. Toward the end of her workshop, Paula Cole Jones asked whether Unitarian Universalists needed a new theology. I do not think so. I think instead we need to engage the theology we already have. As the eager participants in our Every Other Thursday Night Sources Adult RE class are doing with alacrity. For ours is not only a heretical theology. It is heretical for sure, but it is also radical and liberating and life-changing. Not steeped in rigid dogma, we here at UUCIL offer the best launching pad in the area, I am convinced, for taking wing as an anti-racist, anti-oppression, multicultural faith community. Engaging our theology will only fuel that effort and make it more likely you'll be able to fully engage and support each other every time you do fail. Until you look around one day, seven or nine years from now, and go, wow. We reflect the East Bay and the Tri-Valley so much more completely today than once we did. We, fill, we are filled with young people and young families, filled with people with many ethnicities, who have embraced us and our tradition, who, who are eager now to sustain us in the decades to come. Engaging our theology can only help in this prospect. Just, just reading uh, UU's theology makes it clearer and clearer how perfectly poised this congregation is to achieve greatness. If you can just harness your passion and get everyone studying and playing and working and singing and acting out of a shared moral consensus. Consider my friend and colleague Fred Muir, the minister now emeritus in um, Annapolis. In his book Heretic's Faith, Muir quotes a third colleague, Bruce Southworth, quoting yet another the late humanist theologian Henry Nelson Wyman. Talk about engagement. They're all struggling and listening and reading with each other's efforts to make sense of what we're trying to do here. Henry Nelson Wyman says, religion is like sports or any other form of play or art. And he goes on. The professionals who play in the big leagues render a great service to sports. Sports certainly would not pervade our national life as it does if it were not for these professionals. But if you want to find out the true spirit of sports in all the glory of a passion, you must not go to the big leagues. You must go to the backyard, the sandlot, the side street, and the school ground. There it is not a profession. It is a passion. This is as true of religion as it is of sports. Among the professionals, you find a superb mastery and a great technique, but not too frequently the pure devotion. Perhaps in professional sports, the passion is not too important, but in religion, it is all important. A religion that is not passionate simply is not worth considering. Passion you will need, but passion you already have, all of you, and all you have to do is harness it. Unitarian Universalism is very much a sandlot religion, very grassroots in the sense that belief and faith are close to the believer. Without reliance on orthodox tradition, hierarchy, or dogma, 
Our doors are wide open to passion. I renew my pledge today, this morning, to put all of my passion in this effort, this effort to become more racially inclusive and more multiculturally celebratory. I hope that you will join me in this important, engaging, and truly sacred endeavor. This church can be the greatest congregation this town and the Tri-Valley area has ever seen and a model for faith communities everywhere, if only you are unafraid of failure, not afraid to fail again and fail better until success is achieved. Amen.